I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we investigate the case of Maitrice Richardson. Was her death the result of a combination of mental illness and police incompetence, or was it murder? everybody. Welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm your host, Brett, and I am joined, as always, by my favorite co-host in the world, Alice. I'm your only co-host, aren't I? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> you can't no, you say I'm lying. podcast co-host. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hi, Brett. We haven't done that yet, where the famous podcasters go off and do other podcasts with other people. I don't think we'll ever do that. I'm loyal to you, Alice. I'm loyal to you too. And I think you have to be famous first to do that. So. That's a good point. That's a good point. We are missing that element. So, mm. well, thanks to everybody who's been listening and leaving uh, reviews. Uh, we did get our first one star review on Apple. So we were very happy about that because it's always good to have people who don't like you. Um, but if you guys could leave some five-star reviews to sort of balance things out, we would love that. So <laughs> I just thought it was funny you said that because I had that exact same thought when I saw the one-star review. I was like, oh my goodness, you care so much to give me a one-star. I know. The worst reviews are three-star reviews because it's kind of like, eh, you know, <laughs> like, wasn't that good? Wasn't that bad? Just eh. If you're like inspiring people to leave one-star reviews, then I feel like you're doing something. Something right. Anywho. You know, Alice, we've we've done a lot of cases so far, even in our young podcasting career. And I feel like different cases inspire different feelings, you know. I mean, some of them some of them can actually be kind of funny. Uh a lot of them are very sad. But this is a case that I think makes a lot of people angry. Uh and for good reason. Uh and we're talking about the case of Maitrice Richardson. Uh, it's a case that is covered a good bit uh, in the true crime community. And as you're going to see, if you don't know this case, it's a case where the tragedy we're going to talk about was completely avoidable. Uh, and if Maitrice had gotten the care and consideration she should have gotten, she would she would still be with us today. I feel confident in saying that, but she didn't. And I think it's as important to highlight that as it is to highlight any other aspect of this case. We've talked about this before. We are very pro-police. Um, we have a lot of faith in our law enforcement agencies and officers, but this is a case where the police failed miserably. Uh, and, and frankly, may have gone beyond that. And we'll talk about that in a second. But for those of you who don't know this case, uh, obviously, the first thing you should do is listen to our episode that we're going to do here. But then you should immediately log on our website and click on the LA Mag article that was written on my Therese Richardson. It's one of the best pieces of long form journalism I've ever read in any genre, but certainly in true crime. It was written by Mike, by Mike Kessler uh, back in September of 2011, and it's entitled simply What Happened to Maitrice Richardson. And we both enjoyed that article quite a bit. It's informed a lot of our thinking on this case, um, and we definitely think you guys should check it out. So having said that, Alice, take it away. So let's let's start like we often do um, at the beginning of uh, what turns out to be an eventful night. So it's September 16th, 2009. Maitrice Richardson, she 
is driving along the Pacific Highway, uh, Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu, California, when she decides to pull into the parking lot of Jeffrey's Restaurant. Now, Alice, have you ever driven down the Pacific Coast Highway? I have. It's gorgeous. You just have these stunning views of the Pacific Ocean. Um, I, I'm not from that area, but it is just breathtaking. Oh, it's amazing. And there's really no more beautiful place you could start you know, a tragic story like we're going to talk about today. Just wanted to stop and note that because I think it is kind of striking that, you know, this story starts off with her driving down one of the most fantastic uh, drives you can take in America. Right. And we're in Malibu, California. And this restaurant, Jeffrey's, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's an expensive, really nice restaurant. Um and it overlooks the Pacific Ocean. So it's a great restaurant to go to. She pulls in. She's driving her 1998 uh, Civic. And this is uh, the type of restaurant that has valet parking, uh, as many nice restaurants in this area have. And even from the very beginning, she's, she's doing something strange. She parks her car uh, in the valet line as if to get her car valeted. And she gets out. Um, but instead of doing what most of us do, which is stand next to your car or in your car until the valet, uh, in, you know, employee comes and takes your keys, she actually climbs into the valet uh, driver's car. Um, he, you know, he comes back and he finds her in his car and he asks her, you know, what are you doing? And my Trice looks at him and just says, it's subliminal. And then she says she's there to avenge the death of Michael Jackson. Then at that point, she hands her keys to the valet and she goes inside. But as she's going inside the restaurant, she you know, briefly stops and asks if Vanessa has arrived. Vanessa is the name of Mitrice's ex-girlfriend. And uh, the person she asks says, no, there's no Vanessa here yet. Um, Mitrice instructs the hostess to keep an eye out for a girl with tattooed arms. Mitrice then goes into the restaurant and she is seated by herself. She orders an ocean breeze cocktail and a Kobe steak. Before long, though, she uh, hears a table of seven people close to her uh, talking. She doesn't know them. They don't know her. But she hears them talking and she decides, you know, I'm going to go join them. So she gets up from her uh, table where she is by herself and she walks over to this table of seven people and she seats herself right there with her with them and starts talking. She talks about astrological signs and a lot of other kind of strange things. And Someone working at the restaurant notices that Mitrice has changed her table and joined this other group. And the the staffer checks in with the, the group of seven people, you know, making sure is everything fine? Are you being bothered? And one of the uh, people in the group just says, you know, things are bizarre, but they're manageable. You know, they Mitrice seems nice enough. It's strange. People do strange things. So um, the staffer leaves and Mitrice continues to talk to this group. At one point, she tells this group of people that she is going to Hawaii and she will contact them when she arrives. Yeah. So we're obviously very early into this case. You know, we'll back up and talk about her history a little bit at some point, but I think it's, it's obvious to everyone listening. Um, that this is a case where we're going to have mental illness. We're going to have those kind of issues that are going to be impacting my trees uh, really throughout the incidents we discuss. Uh, it reminds you of Elisa Lamb, but with a lot more detail. Uh, you know, we feel pretty confident in the Elisa Lamb case that there was some mental illness going on. Some people debate that. I don't think there's any debate about that here. And one thing I just want to point out. Everyone so far is really behaving exemplary, right? I mean... They're very accommodating to her. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of these folks recognize that something's going on. And, you know, they're sort of taking it in stride so far. I mean, you have Matrice, who's an African-American woman who drives up to this very expensive restaurant in her 98 Civic. That is probably the first time that this valet has ever parked a 98 Civic at this at this restaurant. Um, 
you know, she then goes in, she's acting bizarrely. She sits down with these group of people who have no idea who she was. They would have been well within their rights to complain, but they don't. They, you know, sort of invite her into their group and she basically stays with them throughout the rest of their time at the restaurant. So at this point, you know, these, these folks, it's time for them to leave. So, and let me just note though, you know, we've, we've kind of said that everyone's being really exemplary, really accommodating. Um, and one thing that kind of strikes me of why they're acting this way is even though they recognize that my is acting bizarrely, I don't think anyone feels threatened by her. So, um, like we've mentioned, she's a young woman. She's, she's very attractive. Um, and she's not acting so bizarrely that people are afraid she's going to act in a dangerous manner. I think that's important to note here. Yeah, I think that's right. I think my is harmless, you know, and at this point, you know, this group has left and we just have my trace and she essentially follows them out of the restaurant. The problem is she just ordered a Kobe steak in an ocean breeze and she's got a bill of about $90. Uh, you know, those two things add up at a place like Jeffrey's and the manager says, Hey, you need to pay your bill. And she says, Oh, I thought my friends at the table we're going to pay for it. The manager says, sorry, that's not the case. I'm going to need some money. And she says, I'm busted. What are we going to do? Right. And the manager talks about how when he was, when he was having this conversation with my trees, it was almost as if she was in a trance. And she said some strange things. She said that she was from Mars. Um, she suggested that, hey, maybe we could, you know, work this dead out through maybe having sex. Um, she has no money on her whatsoever, which she proves by essentially, you know, spilling her pockets and her purse or whatever she's got. Uh, she does at one point pull out a joint, which I guess she was going to smoke. And so with this situation sort of escalating, I don't know if escalating is the right word, but it's a weird situation. And these folks call the Lost Hills sheriff station and they say and i think this is a quote we have a guest here who is refusing to pay her bill she sounds really crazy she may be on drugs or something you know as the police are on their way this situation is only getting weirder matrice is saying things like she's been this television show this soap opera she's been watching uh, God is speaking to her through that soap opera, and he's telling her things like, hey, take the afternoon off. So presumably that's why she was driving down the Pacific Coast Highway is because God had directed her to do so. She says she doesn't have any parents, um, just her great-grandmother, Mildred, and the hostess actually calls Mildred. And Mildred says that she can give them her credit card number but you got to remember, I mean, this was a while ago, check the exact year. Yeah, September 2009. You know, today you could probably do that and it would be no big deal, even for an $89 tab. But at the time, you had to have a signature. So they can't just take her credit card number over the phone. And Mildred, you know, she's in her 90s. She's not in shape to drive to this restaurant. So at this point, the Lost Hills deputies have shown up and the manager is telling them about their, about Matrice's, Matrice's strange behavior. One of the officers actually talks to Mildred for a little while. Matrice is, she's essentially, she's calm. She's not freaking out. Uh, she's not, you know, resisting in any way. She's totally cool and calm. And her, her, her grandmother her great grandmother, I guess, maybe being a little bit more streetwise than Matrice was, says they're getting ready to take your black ass to jail. At which point, she Mildred hangs up the phone and calls her daughter or her granddaughter, actually. And this is Matrice's mother, the mother that she claimed had passed away. So two of the Lost Hill deputies um, who had shown up, Frank Brower and Armando Lorero, um, are 
kind of managing the situation. And, oh, I'm sorry, there is actually a third deputy, John McKay. So McKay and Brower search uh, Mitrice's car. It's, it's pretty cluttered. There's a lot of stuff in there. And they didn't report finding her cell phone or wallet or money or anything like that. Uh, they did find her uh, driver's license along with some marijuana scraps, which uh, is consistent with the fact that she had pulled out that joint from her pocket uh, earlier when talking with the manager. And they also report finding some, you know, half drunk bottles of alcohol in her car. And, you know, we were talking earlier how Mitrice seemed calm, cool, and collected, not really resisting. but. One of the arresting deputies does report that Mitrice, and this is a quote, was possibly drunk, making odd statements. Maybe based on the bottles of alcohol found in her car, this um, uh, deputy is saying that she's maybe drunk. And because of this reason, Brower, one of the deputies, um, it begins to administer a field sobriety test on uh, Mitrice. And how he does that is he looks at her eyes, you know, her pupils, checks her pulse, has her do the typical sobriety test um, things, and she passes. She's sober. When he asks Mitrice, you know, why are you at Jeffrey's? Why are you here? She told him that um, she'd been drawn by the lights. So he's trying to figure out what's going on. She's sober, but something's clearly wrong. So the deputy says, you know, Mitrice, are you on medication? Nope. She's not taking any sort of medication. And he also asks her, have you ever been placed on a 72-hour hold for a psychological evaluation? You know, now he's starting to suspect something else is going on. And she responds, nope, nothing like that. So at this point, this is kind of causing a scene. And the employees at Jeffrey's actually, they come out and they, they try, they start considering paying for this $90 bill so that Mitrice can just leave and get a misdemeanor ticket for pot possession and not actually get, you know, arrested. It won't be that big of a deal. But because of the way she's acting and these weird statements she keeps making, the employees actually think, you know what, we don't actually think she's going to be safe if we, if she's allowed to leave. You know, she probably shouldn't be driving. She probably shouldn't be by herself. Um, there's something clearly going on with her. And so kind of thinking in Mitrice's best interest, the manager decides to press charges. Um, and the manager actually later tells a local reporter, Julie Ellerton, that he felt relief when he handed Mitrice off to the sheriff deputies because, and I quote, it was almost like a blessing to my heart at that point. Like, okay, good. This is all going the way it should. I mean, I, I can, again, we've talked about how everyone so far in this story has acted just with a lot of patience and kindness. And I think we continue to see that here. The employees offering to pay for her bill. And the only reason they don't do it is because they want her to get help. They don't want to let her just keep driving and maybe get into worse trouble. Yeah. And they should have every reason to believe all the faith in the world that they are handing my trees off to people who will take care of her. People whose responsibility is to take care of her. And that's what they think they're doing. They think they could be saving her life. Uh, she's having what's obviously some sort of psychological issue. Doesn't seem like it actually is drugs. Something completely beyond her control. And that's what they think they're doing. And they should, that faith should have been vindicated. Uh, but as we're going to see, you know, this is just one of many tragic incidents in this case where if if it had just gone differently if these people had been you know just a little more callous i mean i guess paying her bill is a pretty pretty nice thing to do but if they had thought less about her her safety and what was in her best interest once again she might be alive today but instead they go the extra mile they think about her they think about what's best for her and they think, given her state, she needs to be somewhere where people can make sure that nothing happens to her. And the best place for her at that time is in the custody of the Lost Hills Sheriff's Department. So the police impound her car, which is standard operating procedure, and they head off to the Lost Hills station. Now, it is, you know, a good half hour away 
from Jeffries. It takes him a little while to get over there. It's actually famous because it is where Mel Gibson was hauled off to in 2006 after he had a drunk driving arrest. Uh, he infamously would later be given a drive home by the police, by the deputies from that station. And so that's where she's taken. You know, by this point, her mom, Latisse, she knows that she's being taken. She's being taken off. She knows that she'll be there overnight. She assumes she's in good hands. She also has a 10-year-old daughter, uh, her other daughter, who needs to take care of, and she's asleep. And so basically, she makes the decision, and a lot of parents have made this decision. And I do not blame her for this at all. She know, Maitrice has done this thing. She may need a night just to sort of think about where her life is heading. And maybe in the morning, everybody will be seeing things clearly. And if Maitrice needs help, they can get her help. And this can be sort of a turning point in her life. So, but she wants to make sure, to make sure that she's going to be safe. So she actually calls the station. And she says to the officers in charge, I think the only way I will come and get her tonight is if you guys are going to release her tonight. And then she says, and there's this documentary that you can watch on this case. It's a, it's a great documentary. I can't remember whether it's on Netflix or Amazon Prime. Um, haven't seen it in a while, but very good. And these calls are all recorded, and you hear these calls. And she says, my Teresa is not from that area. And quote, I would hate to wake up to a morning report, girl lost somewhere with her head chopped off. And the police assure her, they assure her, it's fine, she will not be released until the morning. California has something they call a code 5150, which is when you've got somebody who is mentally unstable and they pose a danger, probably, probably to themselves usually, but also to others. In that case, you have the officer essentially has the right to have an administrative hold on this person and you, and you put them in a facility for 72 hours. They can be evaluated, ensured that they're okay. But as we all know, in order to do that, it's going to take some extra time. You're going to have to fill out all the forms. Probably going to have to call in a doctor or take somebody to the hospital. You know, it makes it makes the standard paperwork that you're doing late at night probably a little bit more difficult. It probably delays your trip home just a little bit. So when Matrice comes in, despite the fact that, I mean, you've heard everything that happened at that restaurant. There's not a person listening to this right now who thinks... Ah, she's probably fine. Not a single person. And I don't care what your level of education is, whether you are a, you know, you dropped out of school in sixth grade or you've got a PhD in psychiatry, right? You know there's something wrong with this person. Well, the arresting officer just ignores all that. In fact, he doesn't even put it in his report because why would you do that? And instead, he charges her with this, this simple... You know, defrauding an innkeeper, possession of marijuana, very low-level charges. And that means that because her charges are so minor that it would violate the policy of the police station for them to keep her locked up overnight. Let's stop, let's stop there for just a second. Um, you know, we talk about how the arresting officer doesn't put in his arrest report that she's acting odd. Now, Brett, you and I read a lot of um, police reports. Is this something you would expect to appear in an arrest report? I would. <laughs> yeah. No, did, did, absolutely. I, I, and I would say why, because you typically try to set the scene in your arrest report. Remember, these reports, they may be, you. an arresting officer may be writing many reports throughout a night. And if these cases go to court, they have to testify under oath on the stand. And likely they can't remember all the details. So what you're supposed to do is put everything in the arrest report so that you or another officer could pick it up, not knowing anything about the case and be put back in the situation and can testify accurately about what happened during the arrest. And for, for the call to the police station to 
uh, note that she's making odd statements that she may be under drugs, that's absolutely something you put into the report because you're trying to find some reason as to the person's motive. Why did they act that way? If someone's under the influence of alcohol or drugs, you treat them differently in the sense that you know that they may not be acting in a rational manner. So you have to take certain precautions, Or, but if someone's having a psychotic break, you also may treat them in a different manner than someone who seems in their right mind. So, uh, you know, that was kind of a, a trick question to you, Brett, but I, I would say, yes, this is absolutely something we see in reports and for the reason of being able to accurately describe the situation at a later date. Right. And you can't make informed decisions, whether you're a prosecutor or a police officer, if you don't have all the information. And, you know, I'll just go and tell you, if you ever for whatever reason, a police report becomes important in a case that you're paying attention to. If there's not a lot of information in there, if there's a lot of missing information, I mean, one of two things has happened. And we've talked about this before, and you just have to decide which one's going on. Either somebody's been very lazy, um, or there's or there's some real malicious activity going on, right? Like, I mean, if 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 there's if there is a lot of missing information in a, in a police report that you would expect would be there, that is a huge red flag. And I would say for most prosecutors, if you get a case and you look at the arrest, you know, the arrest report and there's hardly any information in there. I mean, that's a case where you're seriously going to consider at a very early stage whether or not that's even a case you want to bring. Um, number one, because you don't actually know what happened. And number two, Alice is right. These cases often come a year later, and what happens a lot when police officers testify is, number one, they do review their reports to refresh their recollection. And if they're on the stand and they're being asked questions and they can't remember something, they are allowed to refresh their recollection on the stand using their report. The report doesn't come into evidence. The jury never sees it, but they can look at it and sort of remember what was going on. So... For there not to be this kind of information in the report is just, I mean, it's not baffling because it's obvious why it happened <laughs> in this case. It happened because this guy just wanted to go home. And number one, this is not a big deal. He knows he's never going to have to testify because this is never going to be, you know, it's not like this is going to go to trial. And he doesn't care about my trees. Uh, he, he has no interest whatsoever in what happens to her. He just wants to go home. So he doesn't put any of this information in his report. And so, of course, the police immediately call my Teresa's mom and let them know, hey, that conversation with you had, uh, everything's changed. No, they don't do that. They don't Did do that it? at all. <laughs> if only, hey, here's a turning point, though. If Another only they point. had done that. So, if only they had so done if it. you're going to be, if you're going to be lazy and not, um, you know, charge the proper thing and uh, write your report fulsomely, at least let the worried mom know that the conversation you had is no longer the situation. Right. That's all you have to do. All you have to do is make a phone call. You know, I mean, it's not hard. It, it's not, it's not like a lot was going on at the Lost Hills Sheriff Department at however late at night this was. And they knew they'd had this conversation and they knew that a citizen who pays taxes and pays their salaries had, asked them this specific question and yet nothing the unfortunate fact is my Therese doesn't know her mom's number apparently the only number she knows is that great grandmother's number she apparently tries to call her at least four times it's not clear whether it goes through mildred will later say that her phone never rang it's also possible mildred was asleep i mean who knows like i said this is pretty late there are no recordings of this call, so we don't actually know what happened. The officers on duty claimed that uh, my Therese was overheard having conversations. Um, I think most people just assume that's true, and this was part of sort of my Therese's psychological break. I trust nothing, nothing that the police say in this case. So I think it is convenient for them to be able to say, oh, well, we thought she called somebody because we heard her having a conversation. I don't know if that happened or not, frankly. Uh, and I don't think there's any way you can know that. Latisse, thinking that her daughter is safe, 
that she's in the safest place in the world, right? Locked up in a police station. What can happen to her? Uh, at 5.35 in the morning, very early, she's obviously concerned about her daughter, wants to make sure she's okay. She gets up and she phones the station and she's told that my trees is gone. So when Latisse calls the police station, the person she talks to is the jailer, Sharon Cummings. Now, Cummings knows that Maitrice's car was impounded. Remember, we said that was standard police procedure. And she also knew that nobody was coming for Maitrice because this, um, this particular police station is kind of in the middle of nowhere. They did a search of Maitrice's car. We told you what they found. And they know that all Maitrice has is her license and two keys. She doesn't have money. She doesn't have um, a phone. She has no way to contact anyone or money to pay for a cab or a bus or anything. Um, but Cummings has stated repeatedly that Maitrice uh, was offered, uh, she, she was given the offer to stay in the lobby, I guess, until someone could pick her up. But that Maitrice said, no, thank you, that she was going to go meet some friends. This is hard to believe. Maybe Cummings wanted to be believe it, but the reason this is hard to believe that Maitrice was going to meet friends is that, again, she has no communication device on her body, no money, and they're releasing Maitrice at 12.15 in the morning, so middle of the night, on a Thursday, 40 miles from where Maitrice lives, and there's really nothing around there. At that time of night, all the businesses are closed, and even those businesses that are closed they're a mile away. They're not in view of the station. Um, there's really nothing between these closed stores and the police station except empty sidewalks. So it's kind of like a ghost town right now. Right after talking to Cummings, Latisse is starting to get a little frantic. So she calls the police station again. This time she reaches Deputy Kenneth Baumgardner. Again, we have recordings of these calls. And Latisse says, how long before a missing person's report can be filed? Remember, this is like early in the morning, about 5.30 in the morning. And she asks, is it 24 or 48 hours? Baumgartner tells her, and I quote, well, it depends on the circumstances. Normally, I wouldn't recommend doing one that soon. I should stop here for a moment and tell you that Baumgartner at this point, when he is speaking with Latisse, he doesn't know anything about Matrice's arrest or that she was released with, you know, no, no phone, no money. And so Latisse wants him to understand the urgency of the situation. And she tells him about Matrice's situation. And again, she's like, how soon can I file a missing persons report? I think Latisse is probably having um, one of those, you know, mother's intuition moments. She knows something is deeply wrong, even though it's been just a few hours. It's barely overnight. I mean, it's 530 in the morning. Again, Baumgartner tells her, maybe with the situation you just told me about, maybe 24 hours would be reasonable. Um, but, you know, we, we would only really do something like that that soon if we had some reason to believe that the suspect is not quite right. And that's a quote from him. At this point, Latisse is getting really worked up. She, she really feels that something's wrong. She starts crying and she goes and she says, quote, well, yeah, she doesn't know the area. She's never been in your area before. Still, Baumgartner doesn't say, okay, let's file a missing persons report. Rather, he says, you know, let's wait until uh, early this morning. And if she still doesn't turn up, you can certainly call back. Latisse is sobbing at this point, And she tells um, Baumgartner, look, I think my daughter is highly depressed. She is in a depressive state. She's really begging him to help her at this point. And Baumgartner, you know, trying to smooth over the situation, says, you know what, let's just give it a couple hours. Give us some time. Let me go make sure my Trice isn't asleep in the lobby. Um, remember, Cummings knew she's not in the lobby already. I think you would probably know at a police station if someone's just hanging out in your lobby. But he says, let me check the lobby. And he says, and I quote, then why don't you give us a call back in a couple hours? And if she still hasn't shown up or made contact with you, then maybe we can do something for you. <laughs> this is not good. This is not good behavior. Uh, no. I mean, you can't, you can't listen to that 
And I mean, we're giving you sort of the cold version. Uh, like I said, you watch that documentary and you, you hear this and you hear both sides and you will be furious by the time it's over. And it is, it is, there is, this is, so this is a mother wrong. begging for help. I know she is begging for help and sobbing. There is so much wrong with this. It's hard to even start. I mean, number one, how big exactly is the Lost Hills Sheriff's Department? I mean, it's going to take you two hours to figure out <laughs> <laughs> whether somebody's in your lobby. I mean, say, hold on a second. I'll see if she's in the lobby and then Let walk me stick out my there head out see. there. Yeah. It's, this is not hard, you know, and it's just. Why would you have to wait a couple hours to check the lobby? It's the whole, th it is, I mean, it's just, it is a complete and total, there's no defending the police in this. I mean, there's just none. You cannot defend them. Everything they do, every step they take. And it's just like incident after incident. I mean, you could, if, if, if it were one thing, if it were one thing, you could think somebody made a mistake, you know, but the sort of callous nature, the way they don't care at all about what happens to this girl, you know, her mom is telling them, you let somebody out into an area they don't know with nothing who is having mental issues. And they're just like, well, you know, 24 hours or, you know, call back a couple hours. We'll see, you know, maybe we can do something for you. I mean. <laughs> That's not how you, I, I mean, we think back to the day before when the staffers at Jeffries who are making probably tips, you know, they're probably not making much per hour. They're talking about scraping their money together to pay for this woman's $90 bill. You know, she, that's how other people who have no connection to her, no sort of um, agency over her, no responsibility over her are even trying to help. And here we have a police officer saying, mm, call back in a few hours. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely striking. Jeffries got a lot of criticism um, after this happened for handing her over to the police. I mean... You know, there are racial aspects to this case. You can't avoid it. My Therese, like I said, is an African-American African lady. She's also a lesbian, so you've got that aspect going as well. And there were people who felt like, you know, these rich people, I mean, that they just, they just handed this girl over and didn't think a second thought about it. And the reality is completely different. The reality is they're the only people in this. Them and the seven people who were eating there are the only people who acted the way they should. And the people you would expect to be the ones who actually care about her, you know, the people who were sworn to care about her just don't care at all. And the, di the dichotomy there and the comparison between how she's treated by these two different groups of people, it's just shocking. And it just gets worse. Like, the longer it goes, it just gets worse. And it's almost like they are setting out to screw this up. And there's a reason that there are so many conspiracy theories about this, because you almost think, how is it possible for you guys to have done such a bad job here? It's, I don't know. It's, it's remarkable. I mean, it is truly remarkable. And then it gets worse because of course it does. So an hour later, six 30 in the morning. So Lost Hills is now, they're on notice, right? That this young black girl that they had brought in, uh, they have released her into the world, probably with mental problems, with no way whatsoever to, you know, to find her way home, essentially. So at 6.30, Lost Hills gets a call from Bill Smith, who is actually a retired reporter. He lives in a little community called Monte Nido, which is... You know, very rural for, particularly for this area. I mean, California is interesting. Los Angeles is interesting. you got this huge city, but then very close to, the, to Los Angeles, you know, you have these much more rural areas and, and these sort of wild hills. And this is sort of that kind of place. It's a place, you know, where you're raising horses and you got hiking trails. Um, and it's a place called Dark Canyon which is a very evocative name. And Smith says that he had a prowler 
walking around in his backyard. And he doesn't really know what's going on with this person. And he describes her as a slim black woman with Afro hair. And he talks about, he actually asked her, I mean, even though she's a prowler and a trespasser, he asked her if she's okay. And she says, I'm just resting. And again, this, the fact that he's talking to a prowler, again, shows me how Maitrese is vulnerable here. She is not some hardened looking criminal out there. All the people she's come in contact with do not find her intimidating. And the reason people are talk talking to her is she probably looks pretty vulnerable. Right. Of course, you know, Lost Hills, they put two and two together and they send out their officers to, to look for her and they send out a, a be on the lookout so that the rest of the police are on notice that this girl is probably wandering around. No, they don't do any of that. They send a single cruiser. They do the, the bare minimum. <laughs> they do the bare minimum. So, you know, Bill, uh, he's on the phone and he's like, I talked to her through one window and I went to another window to see get a better look at her, but she was gone by then. So they basically send a cruiser down there, take a report, um, and then they don't issue a a bolo, a be on the lookout for my trees for another six and a half hours. They let, they let another six and a half hours go by before they alert all the police officers out there in this area of California to, to look for this girl they have sent out into the world alone, vulnerable, and with nothing to find her way home. So at this point, they they launch an immediate search. No, they don't. <laughs> because, because why would they do that? You know, why would they do any of so the things? Many, so, well, there's just so <laughs> many points where things could have been different. That's why it's it so is, It is so frustrating. So, you know... Even with Latisse calling and, and even with my Teresa's problems, they wait a full two days, two days, uh, to conduct an actual search. One reason we know so little about this case, and you'll see that as we go on, is they don't start from the station where she left. They, you know, and look, this is, I can, I can sort of understand this a little bit. They start at the last location she was seen. They go to Bill's house. Now, the problem with that is that's six miles away from the station, right? And so you wonder, in the middle of the night, when there are no buses, and she has no money, and she has no phone, and she has no vehicle, how did she get six miles away? Now, you know, it's, it's 630 by the time she's seen. She left, you know, what do we say? She was released around 1230. So 1215, you know, she's going about a mile an hour, but we got to assume it's not like she knows where Bill lives. You know, I don't think she took a straight shot uh, to Bill's place. But anyways, you know, it's six hours. It's six miles. She gets there. We have no idea how because the police didn't bother to figure out how. So they go there, they find some tracks that are likely from Mitrice's sneakers. Based on the pattern and based on the stride length, uh, they determined that she had been running at that point. But it wasn't, it wasn't long until they, they lost her. So she's basically heading into Dark Canyon. And there's a lot of other shoe prints. Like I said, there are horses in the area. So there, there's hoof prints. And so they essentially lose her trail about 100 feet uh, into Dark Canyon. So, of course, at this point, you know, they organize a search of Dark Canyon to see if they can find her. No, they don't do that. They, they, don't, they don't bother <laughs> to, to go in to Dark Canyon. Uh, in fact, at all. At all. At all. At all. At all. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, well... In fact, they're going to play hot potato yeah, and pass this yeah, on. Yeah. I mean, which at this point, just get it away from these people. I mean, maybe maybe it'll work out better. But yeah, their first inclination is to figure out a way to get rid of this case, right? So they're the ones who put my trees on the street. They're the ones who let her go in the middle of the night with nothing. But they figure out, ha-ha, 
she's an LA resident. And since she's an LA resident, that means the investigation belongs to the LAPD and their missing person unit. So. <laughs> that, let me just stop there for a second because uh, I'll let you cool down for a second, <laughs> Brett. But also, we see this a lot where there are overlapping agencies that investigate a crime uh, or something of this sort. And it is not this bright line. There are not such, typically, there are not such big egos where you run up to the edge of your jurisdiction or line and you like stop as if you hit a wall and you say, well, got to pass it on to the next person because that's not how investigations work. You work hand in hand. And if you are standing right there where her sneakers have ended, you don't stop and then call the other jurisdiction that you think this falls under. You keep searching. <laughs> I mean, I only say this because many people may not have experiences in these types of investigations where multiple agencies and different jurisdictions are involved. But there's not some like hard and fast rule that they can't keep looking. Um, so for the next step, not to take the logical step of searching where her sneakers seem to be heading is to pass it off kind of bureaucratically to another agency is not best practices. To yeah. Put it I mean, there was nothing that stopped them from going into lost tales. It's in their jurisdiction. You know, I mean, it would be one thing, I guess, if lost tales was on the border of New Mexico and she wandered into New Mexico, you as a California law enforcement officer need to at least call the folks in New Mexico and say, hey, we're looking for a missing person. Looks like they crossed your border. At which point they will say, hey, sure, let's go. We'll come help you. <laughs> you know? Um, and in fact, it seems kind of like they had to come up with a reason. They had to stop and say, wait. My trees was a, aha, she was a Los Angeles resident. I think this is a task for the LAPD. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like they had to come up with a reason as opposed to when you're in the midst of a search, you're probably not thinking where exactly does she reside? You're thinking someone is missing and every minute that ticks by is a minute further from us being able to find her. Exactly. And so, you know, they pass it over to Los Angeles, LAPD. And it gets assigned to their missing persons unit, which you would expect, um, but it's not long before it's assigned to robbery homicide. LAPD said that was because they have more resources. They do have more resources. I actually think, despite their denials at this point, they realize M Mitrice is probably not alive. They actually do some real investigation. LAPD gets criticized a lot, and for good reason, but they actually do things like, I don't know, look in her car to see what's there and they find things like her cell phone and her ATM card and her checkbook and her journals that were in her car and they realize very quickly by the way remember they've already searched her car the the uh, Lost Hills Sheriff's Department and they didn't report right. finding any of this right and they certainly didn't look at any of it <laughs> so but LAPD does look and in her journals, it becomes very clear to them that she had not been sleeping. She was probably sleep deprived. On top of that, she almost certainly was enduring some kind, sort of bipolar episode the night she was arrested. So they now have concerns. Obviously, they have concerns. Um, they've actually looked into this case under, unlike the Lost Hills Sheriff's Department. And it doesn't take long for this to become a scandal, as it should. You've got this young black girl who was in the sheriff's custody, and they have basically just thrown her out into the world. And it, you know, leads to a lot of questions. Her family's asking questions. Uh, her father and her mother, who really did not get along before this, put their differences aside and really started fighting for their daughter uh, and to get their daughter back. And if you watch that documentary, uh, Latisse, I mean, her, her passion... And the love she had for her daughter is, is remarkable and amazing and inspiring. Um, and she deserves so much better than she got from the authorities. And look, people ask questions. Why was it Mel Gibson got a ride home and you said good luck and Godspeed to this young woman and just threw her out into the night? So we're coming to the close of our episode today. This is going to be a multi-parter, obviously. As you probably know, or you probably figured out, on April 9th, 2010, almost a year after she went missing, rangers headed into Dark Canyon to check on a pot farm that had been 
eradicated. And when they found that farm, they also found Matrice's remains. And just so you know, the location where she was found was less than two miles from where she was last seen. So that's where we're going to stop today. We're going to leave you mad. We're going to leave you angry. Uh, and we're going to come back tomorrow and we're going to talk more about the incompetence of this police department, um, what went wrong here, and what our theories are about what happened to my trees. We also want to hear from you. Uh, email us at prosecutorspod at gmail.com. Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at prosecutorspod. Check out our website, prosecutorspodcast.com, where we'll have some documents, some links to those documentaries we talked about earlier. Um, yeah, just let us know what you think. Let us know what we got wrong. You can let us know your theories, too. We'll be talking about those tomorrow, but we'd love to hear yours first. So, like I said, some of these, some of these episodes, they leave you laughing, and we love doing this, and we enjoy being with you guys, but this is one where, you know, your blood's going to boil, and it should. I hate to leave on that note, but <laughs> I don't really know what else to say. Come back for what happens tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutor. Microphone sounds really good. Yeah. By the way. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Thanks to my brother. Thanks, brother. <laughs> your brother. Your brother. Good guy. Very good. We'll have guy. to have him on the show sometime. He would <laughs> love that. I don't know if I would love that because I think he would tell too many embarrassing stories about me. Oh, even more reason. To have it. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. So we have a new case today. 